My name is Jerry Myers. I'm a retired police detective. We would use this as our doorbell and attention getter. It had an amazing effect. When you walk through the door and you're rock, racking the slide and you're telling everybody, hit the floor, get your hands where I can see them, uh, people pay attention. I first met Gary through his wife who was attending my church in the Bellingham area. And uh, really nice lady, soft-spoken. And when I finally met him, I thought, wow, what a contrast. I referred to myself as the uh, uh, designated uh, black sheep, designated heathen of the family. I remember meeting him primarily when I was visiting Greta's mother, who was dying. And I would meet him there. Uh, one time, I came in, and the whole family was gathered around the bed. and. Uh, Oh, they were just having a decent time trying to cheer mom up and spend a good time as family. And I came in, greeted everybody, went around in a circle, shook hands or hugged. And, and then I looked at Greta and pointed to the guy next to her, which happened to be Gary. And I said, well, who's this handsome young man? And he right away just said, you know, don't give me that. And he let out a few colorful words. And everybody was like, Gary, dad, don't talk to the pastor that way. And, and I let them know that I appreciated that because Gary reminds me of Jesus' statement about Nathaniel. Here is somebody in whom is no guile. There is no facade, there's no mask. What you see is what you get. When I was about eight, I had never had any religious experience. And all of a sudden they decided, you're gonna go to church every Sunday and you're gonna get baptized. And I hated the idea. I thought that was horrible. I hated dressing up. Uh, I, I hated going to church, and it was just a war between me and my dad every week. Gary was told at, uh, I think he was an older teen when he was told this by a spiritual authority at, quote, his church at that time, that he was just consigned to hell. There was no turning around. He was just an ornery, terrible person, and God had that route for him and there was no changing that and he bought into that unfortunately and he lived his life accordingly. I knew I was doing the right thing but I knew I was going to hell anyway. So it, it didn't matter much what happened to me. It mattered that I get a few of the bad guys off the street so I could make somebody's life better down the road. And I know that I did that for some people. I knew that dealing with being a religious person would would just destroy me. And the only thing I, I figured that I could do is that I would make my own uh, code of ethics and that I would live by them. And that is about the, the worst, most fatalistic, disastrous decision anyone can make in their lives. So the hardness developed that tough outer shell, and he became a cop, he became a detective, then a narcotics agent, an undercover narcotics agent, where that toughness just, I mean, it was survival now. Every time I would make a decision, it always had an emotional component. And when it's got an emotional component, even if it's a bad decision, you're gonna go with a bad decision in making the decisions in your life. So when it came to drinking and hard living and you know breaking most of God's commandments on a regular routine basis, uh, I was there for that. <laughs> he was really afraid that I would just leave. Plus he was really angry that I had made all these changes. And I said, I understand, I have changed 180 degrees from when we married. I don't smoke, I don't drink. You know, I've now become a vegetarian and um, I do everything differently. And I love God. But the one thing I found out is you're not gonna burn eternally in hell, so I'm not gonna be at your throat. <laughs> and he's going, what? <laughs> but I said, I'm not going to push you, uh, you know, I'm not leaving you, but I can understand 
If you really don't want to be part of this, if you really don't want to live with somebody that's totally changed, I can understand. And, you know, I guess we'll have to work out whatever we can. And we kind of went around and around for a little while, and then, you know, life just went on and got busy, and he got busy with his things, and I got busy with mine, and the kids and I went off and did church things, and every once in a while I'd invite Gary and say, you know, would you like to join us for a picnic? And I could tell he was kind of, you know, do those people bite or what? And he would come to the picnics, and, you know, he found out he kind of liked these people, and they were fun to be around but he didn't want to make a bad habit of it. As much as I hated everything about religion for my entire adult life, there were a couple of things that happened that changed. Uh, Greta's friends from the Adventist church started coming around, and I really loved their company and the things that they were teaching me. I used to have Gary's stepson David in my Sabbath school class and also in our youth group. We had a lot of fun together. When I was younger, uh, I was part of the church for about four or five years. One thing I really wanted was the Hope satellite system. About four or five Christmases ago, I decided to buy my mom a satellite dish with the Hope Channel programming on it, knowing that she would enjoy the, the, the information and the programming that it had. This is the satellite dish that our, our son David uh, brought for my wife, Greta. And I'd always make sure that I turn the TV off of the Hope Channel onto the regular TV before I leave it at night. But there were times I'd come home and I'd find out that it was still on Hope Channel. I thought, well, maybe I just forgot to turn it off. For the first three or four years that we had it, I just routinely ignored everything about it. Once in a while, he'd go to the kitchen and get something, and he'd take it back to his room, and he'd be walking through. And every once in a while, he'd kind of stop a little bit, and then he'd walk away. If I'd walk through the living room and it was on, I'd, I'd close my ears, I'd ignore it, and I'd walk back in the back room and watch TV back there. And I knew he didn't really appreciate it, so I tried to keep the sound down a little bit. Greta, uh, unknowns to me at that time, had been praying for me all these years that eventually that I would find the Lord and that uh, I would find the conviction that she had. Unbeknownst to her, uh, her husband Gary, who was my stepdad, uh, started watching the programming and uh, really enjoyed watching it and watched more of it. I secretly started watching it because I, I didn't want her to know that a, a hard, tough cop was watching anything this silly. One day when she was at work and I was at home, I don't know why, but for the first time, I sat down and I You're turned Hope the Hope Channel on. Mark Finley was uh, preaching a sermon at that day, at that time, and I was stunned. I was, I was in tears, and you know, t tough, uh, hardcore cops don't cry, but I was, I was crying like a baby that day, and I knew that there was something there that Greta had been telling me about for many years. But after I started watching the Hope Channel and I got down on my knees and I started praying to Jesus and I was asking forgiveness, I said, Jesus, I know I need to forgive the people in my life who have damaged me. And it, it just went away. The, the hatred went away. All the animosity, all the desire to get even, forgot all of it. And uh, it was just a, a beautiful, peaceful feeling. And I didn't think that could ever happen. I, I still get really choked up about it when I think about the process that I went through. And once I sat down and, and watched and listened, it was amazing how quickly I started to grasp the principles of that, that Jesus Christ taught when he was on the earth and that those same principles apply today 
and that same forgiveness would apply to me, all I needed to do was to go through all the steps. And, uh, oh, it, it, it was like a miracle uh, to, to, to realize that when, when you felt so hopeless for so long and then you realize that, that God's there for you and he's right here in the living room. Finally broke down and told Greta I've been cheating on you. I've been watching the Hope Channel and and uh, I wanted to start going to church with you every Sabbath. Would you be willing to do that? Uh, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I didn't know if he'd actually get up and, and be ready. And the next thing I know, he's wanting to know if I'm ready to get up and get ready because <laughs> he's already got his shower and he's getting dressed. And I said, okay, I'll be right there. <laughs> Took me totally by surprise. And, um, you know, it felt kind of funny walking into church with Gary and he was excited to be there. He started just barely coming to church services at Bellingham. And I don't know, it wasn't that many, maybe two or three weeks in a row. And then he fell and broke his hip. I tripped over my cat uh, and fell on my right hip and broke it. He couldn't move. He couldn't even get to the phone to hit 911. So he laid there for hours. And as she was picking him up, Greta said, he told me to call you, Pastor. He said, make, he, before he said anything else, he said, please call Pastor Mike and tell him I'm not going to be there this uh, Sabbath for service, but it's not because I'm flaking on him. I'm not. I'm going to come back. I just got to get over this hump. And that's what he said before he said, get me to the hospital or take away my pain or do something else for me. Uh, he was so sincere. And that's, uh, again, what you see is what you get. I'm Phil Nelson. I'm an elder here at the Bellingham Seventh-day Adventist Church. I got to know Gary when we took communion to his wife Greta. She was staying at home because he had broken his hip. And I think that because I had that time of rehabilitation where I had a lot of time at home to think, to reevaluate my life, that was when the Hope Channel, the 3ABN Channel, and, and everything else just came front and center and became the most important part of my life. Around the clock, around the globe, there is hope, Hope Channel. You know, since then, that's, that's about all we want. I started watching Jose Rojas and Monty Church, and there's many others that are, that are on the, those, the, the two channels that just had uh, an, in, an intense impact on growing a testimony in me that Jesus Christ is real, that being able to be forgiven for your sins is something that can really happen. He asked if uh, he could take communion at the time, and we agreed to give him communion because, of course, in our church, we allow anybody to take part in communion as long as they understand it was because Jesus died for their sins. It's the first time in my life I had really started to understand that. And at that time, I started meeting with uh, uh, Pastor Mike uh, Demma, and he started coming over and having regular visits at our, our house here. And he, he had to drum it into my head sideways and down and every which way to finally really make me conclusively understand that God forgives all sins. He forgives all sinners and that all we have to do is accept him, love him, keep his commandments, and spend every waking minute trying to find other people that I can to the same light. Boy, I could see that the Lord was working on his heart. His slowly but surely things were changing. His countenance would change. He would tell more jokes. He would talk about the things he was learning from reading his Bible or from watching one of our preachers on the Hope Channel. 
and I just got to really be close to the man. Uh, soon after that, uh, when he'd still come to church, we would spend a little time together. I'd sit at their table at potlucks, uh, started Bible studies with him in his home, and I also recommended that he go to a men's ministry group. And at first he thought, well, I'll go just to get the pastor off my back. Uh, and he didn't want to be going there to where people are really opening up and they're sharing their hurts and their woes. He wasn't quite there yet. But after a few meetings, uh, Here's Gary. I think it was his second or third Band of Brothers meeting he ever went to. He calls me up and I could tell his voice was kind of teary and he's saying, he's telling me, we keep things confidential in the group of course, but he told me that somebody was going through a hard time and he wanted me to be able to give him scriptures so he can call that brother and give him some encouragement. And, uh, and Gary was saying that through uh, just a, a crackly, teary voice. He has definitely allowed the Lord to make that crust crumble a bit, quite a bit, and uh, it just shows the softness that God's developing in him. I, I consider him a real friend, and it's just a great joy for me to watch how God is continuing to work in Gary's life. When it was coming close to getting baptized and I'd been spending a lot of time with Pastor Mike, I knew I, I didn't feel like I could ask Jesus for a complete forgiveness of my sins unless I had gotten to the point where I quit drinking. I drank heavy and hard every day of the week. Every, it was at night when I'd come home from uh, police work. I'd never drink while I was driving. I'd always come home and just get blasted. And the thing that's amazing is that I asked Jesus to take that temptation and that addiction away from me because I didn't think I was capable of, of being able to handle that on my own. And to my surprise, he took it away and I've never had the temptation. I've never had the desire and it's like, it's like Christmas, the 4th of July. It's like all your birthdays put together. It's the best thing that could ever happen to you. Not waking up hungover every day. Uh, not feeling guilty every day. Um, and it's when I knew that, that alcohol was no longer an issue that then I felt really comfortable going to Pastor uh, Mike and saying, I want to get baptized. Hearing that he was going to be baptized, of course, we decided to make the, the, the drive up. Uh, and also on that day, they decided to renew their wedding vows. So we went up and uh, he, he was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church and they renewed their vows. It was a, it was a, a pretty exciting time. Uh, for all of us, especially my mom, I know that my mom really wanted to have that that bond with her husband. Uh, you know that that that, that strengthening that the church brings uh, between the two of them, and I don't think that she ever thought that it would happen. And I, I know that she's extremely excited that he decided to to be baptized into the church. On October 31st of uh, last year, he did baptize me and he renewed our wedding vows and that's just the sweetest, uh, most treasured experience of my life. You know, if I could say a couple of things to anybody who <clears throat> might listen to this in the future, you know, anybody, if, if you've never seen the Hope Channel or, or the other channels on the, on the satellite from the, from the Adventist Church, if you have a chance to save up a, a, a little money and get one of those, you'll forget about regular TV. It's, it's, it has that powerful impact on about everybody I've ever talked to. The other thing is if there's a wife or a husband or anyone out there who is praying for a member of the family or a friend or a loved one that I want them to find the, the light. I want them to, to, to come to Christ 
and I, I don't want them to give up. Uh, Greta prayed for me for 25 years, and she never gave up. She never gave up praying. And I think it's because of her prayers and busting my hip and a few other things that uh, really made a difference that, wow, this is where I got to go with my life. It was just like when I was making drug busts. If I could get one person off drugs, I was doing my job. And I look at it now, if I can help one other person come to Jesus Christ and totally understand his love and his acceptance, then I've done my job. I'm not near the lunatic I used to be. <laughs>